Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. I am Danielle, aka Stitcherista here on YouTube, and today is Tuesday, May 3rd. And if you hear noise outside, just you'll have to excuse it. Bill is working on his boat trailer. He actually took off this whole week to go fishing. He went fishing yesterday. It's kind of gloomy outside today, so he's doing stuff around here. And then I think he's actually going to go to work Wednesday and Thursday and then take off Friday. So... So let's have a chat. So yesterday, remember I didn't work and I wound up, I had five bags of stuff that I took to Goodwill yesterday from uh, my crafting area. And remember I said I was going to do like one section a week because I can only put out so much for trash men or whatever. Nah. Nah, because I can't like just stop and let it go, right? So last night, oh, mind you, I did no stitching yesterday. So I have no progress to show you. So last night, <clears throat> we still went to bed at like eight o'clock because Bill had been up since 4.15 for fishing. And I did so much yesterday. Oh, I cleaned my office yesterday. So I went through my desk the whole top of my desk, organized all my cords, got rid of an old DVD player, um, cleaned out the drawers, cleaned all of my stitching area. I even, um, you know, organized my highlighters and put them in this little thing um, and then organized my patterns. So I organized my patterns by designer, meaning I'm going to show you an example. So I clipped all of my Darling and Whimsy Quakers. See how I have a bunch of these binder clips. So they're all right there. And then, so that's how I did it. I went through and I just clipped together designers. Like here are all of my Primrose Cottage Stitches patterns. Yeah, it, it makes it so much easier because how I had had these, and I have these stored in cardboard, like really good cardboard magazine holders, and they're sitting on my table, like underneath my table. So it's very nice and neat, because, man, I have just been a woman on a warpath, like a woman with a mission, and I told Bill, I said, I'm not buying any patterns, I swear to God, I'm not buying anything to come into this house, unless I really, really, I did buy one thing today, and I'm going to tell you what it is. So... Like I said, I cleaned all around in here and got that done. I still have the closet to do because that is going to take me a minute. But I felt really good about what I had gotten done. The rest of my office all cleared out and everything. So I had done so much though over the last two days as far as clearing out, moving stuff, putting stuff in my car, lifting bags. I think it caught up with me. I don't know what was happening last night. My back hurt so bad. I almost was like, we need to go to hospital. Like it was bad, but I took some Tylenol and laid down and I feel much better today. So I just, Bill's like, you're doing too much, you know? <coughs> <coughs> so last night, coughed my motherfucking head off, was trying to not take cold medicine I had to get up at three in the morning. Well, I hadn't really even gone to sleep three in the morning to take more cold medicine so I could sleep. Now, today we were supposed to have a job. I'll get to that though. So last night when I was up at midnight, one in the morning, I decided to clean my bedroom out. Now I'm not, I have stuff under my bed, like an old, um, artist, like bed tray. And I have like a foot massager, a hand massager. I have like stuff under there. I'm not touching that right now. That that's just gonna stay like that. Um, yeah, I'm not I'm not touching that stuff right now. But I got the rest of my bedroom done. I got my entire dresser cleared off, the inside of my dresser all cleaned out and organized. I even cleaned out my vanity and I cleared out, remember for Valentine's Day, was it Valentine's Day? Not this past year, the year before, Bill got me that, or that like salon cart thing that you can organize 
hair dryer, curling iron, all your hair stuff. I was able to put a lot of my headbands and stuff in there because I cleared out all those drawers. And one of the silicone things that slip into, there's like a tray that pulls out that I can put my hair dryer, curling iron, hair straightener. One of those things is missing and I don't know if it ever even came with it. So I went online today and I ordered one to fit in there because I want to be able to put my hair straightener in there. But one of the best things that I discovered last night, so I have a power strip down there for my hair dryer, curling iron, straightener, all that stuff. And because I have also vanity lights around the mirror. I had the power strip on the floor and I found myself literally every day bending over and I could feel like I was pulling something in my back, which may sound crazy, but doing that twice a day, because I would turn it on, turn everything on, then turn it off to turn everything off. I was doing that twice a day and it was starting to wear on my back, I'm telling you. And I said, you know, I have to find a different way to have that power strip up higher where I'm not bending over. So Bill and I had got this small table at uh, Ollie's and I had had that next to me, but it was, it was like in my way, kind of, I couldn't open the drawers of the cart. So last night when I was organizing and I was cleaning out the drawers, I found this whole row of these circle stickers, like double-sided stickers. And I'm like, what do these even go to? And as I went to throw them away, I was like, oh my God, I can stick them on the power strip and stick the power strip to the side of my cart. Chef's kiss. Let me tell you. I was so proud of myself because I'm like, well, is it going to hold it? Yep. I stuck it on there last night and it was still on there today. And when I got ready this morning, I just reached over and went, doot, doot. oh my God. See, that's the problem with not knowing what's in your drawers. I never know I had those stickers in there. But let's go because man, is my bedroom nice and neat now. Got rid of like all my stuffed animals except the cabbage patch that Bill got me a couple years ago. He's like, you can't get rid of that. Really? <laughs> so I was able to put my grandparents' picture on my dresser now. Like it is miraculous down there. It is so nice and neat. Nightstand, all nice and... Yeah. So did that. And then this morning I cleaned like, you know, our bedroom up here, our master bedroom, which is Bill's bedroom now. I still have my dresser and stuff and I still have all my clothes up here. So... I cleaned out shoes that I'll never friggin' wear. Um, and I cleaned off, like, I cleaned out my jewelry. Like, I have a lot of costume jewelry that's just piece of pieces of crap. And um, just cleaned off stuff and just, it is so, I'm telling you, and many of you do the minimalist thing. A lot of you commented yesterday. And it truly is so freeing to be able to open a drawer and see everything in it. Yes, indeedy. So I had another, between cleaning out the closet, old shoes, old stuff, I had three more bags of stuff to take to Goodwill. Yeah, I did that today. Because, okay, so the preface, I get up at 7.30, four and a half hours sleep, and our job was supposed to start at 10.30. So I get up and the first thing I do when I get up and I come up here is I check my boss's email because just to see if stuff happened overnight. Um, the job canceled at 10 o'clock last night and no one saw it, meaning my boss didn't see it because you with this firm, you have to confirm that you saw the cancellation. So I text her, I text the whole team and I'm like, tell Bill and I'm like, well, I'm going to make use of today. So he actually had to go out and he picked me up cough medicine because I told him, I said, I can't be fucking coughing like I have been. I can't. And it's by Delson is the company. Man, it tastes really good. I was really surprised. It has like a very pleasant grape flavor. I've never tasted. It doesn't taste like medicine at all. Highly recommend. So he did that and I went to Goodwill and then I came home and I said, well, I'm going to do my video. And then I'm going to tackle my office closet because that is the last big area that I have to do. And I think I'm telling, I think after I'm done that, I'm done. Like the only other things I really wanted to clear out was like our hall closet where we have like board games. I may clean out the wrapping paper thing. I have like this thing that I've had for probably 15 years 
that you hang it on a coat, like a, you hang it like you would in a closet, but it will hold like gift bags, wrapping paper. I need it. It's like an organizing station. I need to clean that out. It's out of control. Like it's like really stuffed. And there's like an old coat that I need to get rid of. So I'm probably going to donate that and I'm going to clean out. Um, yeah, I need to clean that closet out. I need to just maybe not go through the games. We just like threw shit up there. Like there's an old lunchbox up there, you know, crap like that. That winds up cluttering your house. No. No. So, oh, do I have a tissue? And please tell me I do. Oh, thank God. I feel my nose starting to run. Yeah, my mom said she had a cold a couple weeks ago. She had it for two weeks, she said. I'm like, well, I'm heading that way. Yesterday was a week. Anyway. Okay, so hurtling down that way. Um, I am going to have some stuff to sell on eBay, though, out of that closet. I know I am because... I have two cable modems in there. What the fuck do I have those in there for? I have no idea. They're not even opened. Sealed. So I'm putting those on eBay because somebody could use those. And I have um, two sets of Sulky, actually, like two cases. I'm probably going to sell those. Um, my old set of DMC, I think I'm going to sell. And then I have an Elan lap stand that's not even open, still in the package. What am I doing with all this stuff? So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to put that stuff on eBay and sell it. So when I put that stuff on eBay, I will link them in the in a video so you guys can go check them out. Um, <coughs> maybe not the modems, but the craft stuff I will. Yeah, there's going to be a, a handful of things. Um, those things that, you know, that you can get. See, and that's the thing. So I was listening to The Minimalist last night. And they were talking about, do you donate or do you sell? And Bill's always like, you don't like money. You don't want to sell something. Do you, you have to weigh what my aggravation of listing it, monitoring it, packing it up, shipping it, blah, 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 all of that versus taking it to Goodwill. Do you know what I mean? Like there is aggravation in selling stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. So, but like the cable modems and things like that, things that are sealed, easy. That's easy to sell. You just fucking list it and yeah. All right. Now I did pick the winners of the Stony Creek magazines. I already contacted them. I picked the winners yesterday. And what I've started to do is you can turn off like accepting um, entries. So I do that every time I go in there. So you know when you go in there that you can't enter anymore. So one of the magazines went to Michael Jones, one went to Carrie's Cross Stitch, and the other went to Dawn McCreary. So congratulations to all of you. Thank you to everyone who entered. Um, I may find some stuff in there. Maybe I'll do another giveaway. Who knows? I know that I'm donating all the books I have in there. I don't touch those fucking books. Somebody else can read them. And our library has a big bin outside that you can just put books in. I'm going to have a lot of books for donating. And what's nice is it's going to free up a lot of space in there for me to put, like, craft stuff or office stuff. <coughs> I'm telling you. <coughs> oh, my God. <coughs> when I take, I'm going to try to take a small video of what that closet looks like before I do it. I opened it for Bill yesterday and I'm like, I fucking can't with that. That's the worst part. That is the worst. That's even worse than my craft area was. It really is. Although the craft area was pretty bad, like under the buffet. I just had stuff just shoved in there. And when I pulled it all out, I'm like, when you don't know what you have. Yeah. And I even told Bill, so we have a utility room downstairs that has our washer and dryer and our hot water heater. He has shelves, like these big shelves all the way around, stuffed to the gills with I don't know what, stuff before I was even here. And when we buy in bulk, like toilet paper, paper towels, um, things like that, like Ziploc bags, they're all sitting on the floor. And I, I, it hit me yesterday. And I said to him, you realize if we can get in there and clear off those shelves, 
we can put the toilet paper and the paper towels and on the shelf and get it off the floor. He's like, oh yeah, I know. Really? Do you know? Do you? Because he's not going to be a minimalist like me. He's not going to stop buying stuff. And I'm not going to be convincing him otherwise. Maybe I'll rub off on him though down the road. When he sees me not buying stuff. But, um, so much fucking shit. Like, it is. Oh, and that reminded me. So, Marianne, the one who made me the junk journal and who is making me two other ones. She's doing them as a gift. She's doing one Monopoly themed because I want, instead of stitching the whole Monopoly board pattern, I wanted to stitch each individual property and like maybe journal a little bit of the history of Illinois Avenue, Tennessee Avenue, something like that. I thought that'd be a cool thing. Love Monopoly, right? But the idea of stitching the whole board, but stitching each, like I could stitch each piece like on perforated paper and put it in there. Anyway, she is making me a Monopoly themed junk journal. And she is also making a bigger one. You remember I was joking and I said I wanted a bigger one, not joking that I want a bigger one because it will let me stitch a little bit bigger things and not be confined to, you know, a six by seven page. So she's making those two for me. And she messaged me the other day after I talked about how I can't bring any more shit into this house and I'm getting rid of stuff. And she's like, you still want the journals, right? Um, yeah, because they serve a purpose, right? You have to ask yourself a couple questions, you know, if you're going to bring something into the house. Like those journals, they're going to serve a purpose. I can put them in my cabinet, my little cart thing, but they're serving the purpose. They're serving a purpose. Um, but having like multiples of, I'm trying to think of an example, like winter hats, like have fucking 15 winter hats. I don't need 15 winter hats. I had hats downstairs on my dresser that I haven't worn in like eight years. Why do I still have them? No. See, it's that kind of stuff. If it's going to add value to your life, if you're going to use it now, not I'm buying this just in case. No. And thank you for the suggestions of other YouTubers that do minimalism because I've started to follow Dana K. White and I also follow the Minimalist Mom. Well, I love both of them. So yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so I thought today we would do a true crime story. <coughs> if I can get through it without hacking and coughing. Since I have no stitching to show you. I'm hoping to stitch tonight because Bill's going to be going to work tomorrow. So I will, um, be able to get up here at eight o'clock. Depends on how tired I am after cleaning out that freaking closet. Yeah. All right. So this one is called death of a beauty queen. Back in the mid eighties in the small town of Nixa, Missouri, Jackie Johns was considered a local treasure. Everyone loved Jackie and what was not to love. The 20 year old was as cordial as she was beautiful not in the least bit conceited about her good looks. The former prom queen and beauty pageant winner was a major draw at the diner where she worked. Patrons flocked to the place, not for the food or the service, but to be treated to Jackie's dazzling smile and pleasant manner. Also living in Nixa at that time was a far less likable character, a man named Jerry Carnahan. Jerry was 28 years old and married. He was the head of a prominent local family. He was the proverbial spoiled rich boy, used to getting his way and prone to throwing a tantrum when he didn't. And what Carnahan really wanted was Jackie Johns. He's married. Everyone in town knew that he was obsessed with Jackie, a fixation that had started when she had worked at his father's business. There, his romantic overtures had become so persistent that she had been forced to quit. Oh boy. That hadn't stopped his pursuit, though. He started showing up at the diner, pestering her for a date. Jackie's protestations that she would never go out with a married man and that she had a boyfriend fell on deaf ears. Carnahan would not be dissuaded. You gotta love that, right? Yeah. If anything, his propositions became more persistent, more aggressive. Mm. On the night of June 18, 1985, Jackie worked a shift at another of her jobs, a convenience store. She left that evening driving her distinctive black Camaro with the vanity plate Jackie-1. 
She was headed for her parents' home where she still lived, only Jackie didn't make it home that night. Her car was found by a truck driver abandoned at the side of US 160. Concerned, the trucker called Jackie's boss at the diner, who arrived a short while later to inspect the vehicle. The car door stood ajar. Looking inside, the cafe owner spotted Jackie's purse and several items of clothing. He also spotted something far more disconcerting, a significant quantity of blood. Ugh. Police officers were soon on the scene and soon made another discovery, one that did not bode well for the missing woman. In the trunk of the car, a detective found a bumper jack coated with blood and with clumps of human hair clinging to it. Fuck me. It was then that police knew that something bad had happened to Jackie. A search was launched and would be tragically resolved four days later on June 22nd. That was when a couple of fishermen were casting their lines into Lake Springfield and spotted something floating in the water. Jackie Johns had been found. Mm. The young woman had died a terrible death, suffering multiple skull fractures. These would later be matched to the carjack found in her vehicle, confirming it as the murder weapon. Before her death, Jackie had also been punched multiple times in the face, her beautiful features obliterated by a flurry of blows that caused severe bruising and swelling. She had also been subjected to a brutal rape. Semen was recovered from the corpse, but would be of little evidentiary, evidentiary value until the police had a suspect in custody. And in 1985, DNA stuff wasn't that great, was it? I don't think it was. Um, but, you know, whenever I hear about, like, the brutal murder, like, this is brutal, I always think to myself, how do you, as a parent, an aunt, a sister, a brother, whatever, how do you get over knowing your daughter, sibling, cousin, net, whatever, died this horrible, horrific death? I don't know how you ever can get that out of your head. <coughs> <coughs> I don't know how you ever get past that. Okay, so, but who had murdered the popular beauty queen? If the local rumor mill was to be believed, the police should be focusing on one man, Jerry Carnahan, right? Everyone knew about Jerry's obsession with Jackie, but the cops honed in, on, honed in instead on Jackie's boyfriend, only dropping him as a suspect when he provided a rock-solid alibi. Then their attention switched to regular patrons at the diner where Jackie had worked and to one man in particular, known locally as a weirdo, and they have weirdo in quotes. He too had an alibi. He had been in the county lockup on the night that Jackie Johns met her grim end, so he didn't fucking do it. It is easy to speculate on why the police had not yet considered Jerry Carnahan as a suspect. The more cynical among us might suggest that the status of the Carnahan family, owners of the foundry and the town's largest employer, had something to do with it. Mm. But perhaps it was simpler than that. Rumors and conjecture are seldom considered solid evidence. Carnahan, though, was about to be thrown right into the mix because a new clue had emerged. Mm. During a search of Jackie's car, the police had found a receipt from a local 7-Eleven indicating that she had stopped there just after 11 p.m. on the night she was killed. Now, as detectives questioned the clerk, they learned that another car had pulled into the lot just after Jackie, a classic 60s Chevy truck with a distinctive blue and white paint job. Everyone knew who drove that car. It was Jerry Carnahan. Ha-ha! Brought in for questioning, Carnahan told police that he barely knew Jackie. Liar. Liar right from the get-go. He had seen her a few times at the diner, he said, and was aware that she had worked briefly in his family's business. According to him, he had exchanged scarcely a dozen words with her. Yeah, right. Come on now. As for the night of the murder, he said that he had gone to dinner with his stepdaughter and was home by 10.45 p.m., and he had not left the house after that, and his stepdaughter backed up the story. She said that she was a light sleeper and would have woken up if her dad had gone out. Hmm. Sus. Carnahan was allowed to leave, even if the police were far from convinced by his alibi. Also suspicious was the fact that his hands were covered in abrasions and that he seemed to be trying to hide them during the interview. Remember, Jackie was punched in the face multiple times. Then detectives spoke to Jackie's friends and learned that Carnahan had lied to them about not knowing Jackie. According to them, he had literally been stalking her, constantly making inappropriate comments that made her uncomfortable. 
In the days before she died, Jackie had complained to several of her friends that she felt as though she was being watched. Oh, boy. We know he did it. We know he fucking did it, right? Jerry Carnahan had now been elevated to the top of the suspect list. It was only going to take one additional piece of evidence for police to arrest him, and that came when Carnahan's own brother said that he had spotted Jerry's truck on the night Jackie Johns died. It was parked on the shoulder of US-160 along the route that Jackie would have taken. The arrest warrant that was issued, though, was not for murder. The DA was not convinced that there was enough evidence to link Carnahan to the crime. Instead, the warrant was for evidence tampering based on the lies he had told the police about his relationship to Jackie. This at least would put him in custody, allowing investigators to build their case for murder. However, Carnahan was one step ahead. When officers arrived at his home, they found that he had boarded a plane to Los Angeles with a connecting flight to Thailand. Oh yeah, I'm not guilty. I'm just going to go to Thailand all of a sudden. Arrested at LAX, Carnahan was brought back to Missouri. Here, his family immediately lawyered up, hiring a crack legal team. In no time at all, they had succeeded in getting the evidence tampering charge thrown out, and the ball was now in the DA's court. Was he going to bring murder charges? The answer to that question was no. The evidence simply wasn't strong enough. Carnahan would likely walk on the charge and would then enjoy double indemnity pr protection. It was not a chance that prosecutors were prepared to take. This was a victory for high-priced lawyers, a defeat for justice. So they're biding their time because they feel like it is him. But yeah, they don't want to bring him to trial without concrete evidence because, yeah, double jeopardy. You can't be tried twice. But the Jackie Johns affair would not be Jerry Carnahan's last brush with authority. In March 1993, so eight years later, he attempted to abduct an 18-year-old woman and was sentenced to two years in prison. He was out on bond awaiting his appeal when he got into an armed standoff with officers responding to an alarm at his home. That added another 15 months to his sentence. Just a few months later, on September 17, 1993, he broke into the custom aluminum foundry in Aurora, loaded up $60,000 worth of equipment, and then lit the building on fire. What? Charges of burglary, theft, and arson will land him with an additional four years. Released in September 1997, Jerry Carnahan drops from our radars over the next decade. But he was back in the news in 2006 when cold case investigators decided to take another look at the Jackie Johns case. The police still had semen from the original crime scene, and now they also had the technology to test it, to extract a profile, to match that profile to a perpetrator. Remember, yeah, 1985, that stuff wasn't around. So it is now, okay, 85 to 2006. So it's almost, it's 21 years later. 21 years. No one was particularly surprised when the results came back and fingered Jerry Carnahan as the killer after three decades. Oh, it was 30 years? 85 to 95, 90. No. Am I calculating that wrong? It was 85, right? I'm looking. Yeah, 85 to 2006 is only 20 is only 20 years. 21 years? Yeah. Okay, so after three decades, they still say after three decades, he was finally going to be made to answer for the evil he had perpetrated against an innocent woman. Jerry Carnahan was brought to trial in September 2006. Here, prosecutors offered a theory of what might have happened that night. They suggested that Carnahan, frustrated by Jackie's refusal to go out with him, had finally decided to take by force what was denied to him. He had stalked the young woman for several days, waiting for his opportunity to strike. That opportunity had come with Jackie's late night stop at the 7-Eleven. While she was inside, Carnahan drove up on up the road, pulled onto the shoulder and put his hood up, pretending to have car trouble. <clears throat> he knew that Jackie would be passing that way. All he had to do was wait to spring his trap. Oh boy. Jackie was not the kind of person to leave a fellow motorist stranded on the side of the road in the middle of the night. Perhaps she didn't recognize Carnahan's truck 
or perhaps she did and decided to help anyway. In either case, the result was the same. Carnahan attacked her, beat her into submission, and then raped her. Then he took the carjack and savagely bludgeoned her to death. Later, he drove the body to Springfield Lake and dumped it in the water. Jerry Carnahan was ultimately convicted of rape and first-degree murder, and he was sentenced to life in prison without parole. Never again will he be free to walk among us. The world is a safer place for it. Absolutely, thank God, because, boy, he didn't just do crimes against her. He did all kinds of nasty shit. So, dude. Okay, so let's read, like, an inspiring story. Brain cleanser, right, for that. So this one is called Change Your Course Now. This is a good one. I've already previewed it. It's, it's pretty short. So a ship had been at sea in bad weather for days. As the visibility was not good because of a heavy fog, oh, excuse me, the captain stayed on the bridge to keep an eye on all directions. Suddenly, the lookout on the bridge cried, I can see light far away. Oh, excuse me. I can see light far away. The captain shouted to the signalman, signal the other ship. We are on a collision course. It is advisable that you change your course 30 degrees. The signal that came back read, you are advised to change your course 30 degrees. <laughs> <coughs> the captain said to the signalman, send to him, this is the ship's captain, change your course 30 degrees immediately to avoid collision. Dude. I'm a seaman second class, came the reply. No, I repeat, you change your course immediately to avoid collision. Oh boy. When the captain became furious, the original captain, right? He said to the signalman, send, this is a U.S. battleship, the second largest in the United States. I demand that you immediately change your course. Then came the signal from the others. This is a lighthouse. It's your call. Meaning the lighthouse can't fucking change its course. It's stationary. So you need to change your course. And this is, again, about assuming. You can't assume anything, right? Isn't that hilarious? That's a good one, right? That guy assumed it was a ship. Nope. It's a lighthouse. I like that, though. Okay. How are we going to continue to unfuck ourselves in 2022 besides decluttering? I'm on a mission. I'm telling you, I feel so good about what I've, what I've done. Really? I mean, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. This is good. Your upsets say much more about you than anyone else. Yes. How you behave when something upsets you or what you let upset you says a whole lot. And also, what also says a whole lot about you is how you behave in, t in times of strife. It's easy to behave, be happy, be glad, blah, 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 when things are going good. But how are you when things are going bad, right? Yeah. Like, what hill are you going to stand on? What hill are you going to die on, right? Yeah. Where are you going to take your stand? All right. So I hope to have stitching to show you tomorrow. I have not stitched in two days. <coughs> <coughs> Damn this cough. <clears throat> um, yeah, I'm over it. I'm so over it. But um, not upset about having today off. It let, will let me get the rest of my cleaning out stuff done. I'm taking advantage of it. So I hope you guys all have a great Tuesday. As always, if you have any questions, please leave them in the comment section below and I will answer them to the best of my ability. Thank you so much for watching and subscribing and spending about 35 minutes of your day with me today. And I will see you in my next video. Bye guys.